Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the privilege you give us. Thank you for this word that you have given us to study, to learn from. And Lord, we pray as we read and study once again that everything we learn, you give us the grace to follow through in Jesus' name. And we're praying. Our obedience will not be partial obedience. Obedience among the men. Obedience among the women. Obedience among the old. Obedience among the young. Obedience among the long time veterans. The workers. The leaders who have been there for such a long time. And obedience among those who are just coming in. Obedience in the whole team. That Lord as we are looking at this Joshua. And the officers. And the priests. And the people that supported. The ministry of moving on to the promised land. Lord we pray. The same kind of obedience that they had. Immediate obedience. Implicit obedience impeccable obedience a kind of impressive obedience instant obedience lord we pray you grant every one of us in jesus name a kind of obedience that does not choose when to obey what to obey but it takes all your word the totality of your word and then we'll obey that when it's simple, when it's hard, when it's easy, when it's tough. Oh Lord, we pray you grant us that kind of obedience in Jesus' name. A kind of obedience that is very careful and looks at every minute detail of the, of the mind of God, the demand of scripture. And even when we don't understand why. We we'll still do what you have called us to do. We we'll pray you do that for us. In Jesus' name. Obedience in every section of the work. Every area of the work. Obedience among the preachers. And then all the other sections of the work. Implicit perfect obedience in the sight of the Lord. Grant unto us. In Jesus' name. That the beauty of the unity of faith. That we see in this team of Joshua. That that same unity. That same beauty. Fellowship. Unity. Agreement. Cooperation. Submission. Consecration. Binding our hearts together. To walk in the way of the Lord. You grant to every one of us. Obedience when we are happy. Obedience when we are not happy. Obedience when things are going on fine. Obedience when things are not going the way we thought. Obedience at every time. We pray, Lord, we'll demonstrate it. Not only here, but everywhere we go. We go into the world once again, Lord, now open our eyes to see. Open our heart to understand. And then give us the dynamic energy within us. To carry out everything you're teaching us. In Jesus name we pray. Now we come to chapter 4 of Joshua. In Joshua chapter 4. The children of Israel. Joshua. And the priests. And the officers. And their elders. They were told to do something. They were to raise up a monument. They were to raise up something that the present generation will see. And something that the coming generation will be able to observe. Something they were to raise up this great stone. The indestructible monuments of the great things the Lord had wrought in their midst so that for them it would be a permanent record a record in their heart 
a record on sight that every time they passed, they'll be able to see. See what God has accomplished and see what God has manifested and performed. And as a result of that, they'll always remember this great God, this mighty God, and this God who has done the impossible. Not only that, they wanted to raise up, they were told to raise up a monument that then the coming generation will be able to see that monument and every time they see the young people begin to ask questions. You know, the young, how inquisitive they are. They'll be asking their parents, why this? We'll read it later. But the point is, they were to raise up this pile of stones inside River Jordan. And you know, River Jordan at that time was overflowing its bank. And they were to raise up the stones. It will be shooting up. And then in the, in the dry season, then people will see the pile of stones there. And then in the rainy season, when the river Jordan is overflowing its back, they'll see the pile shooting up out of the river. And then the children will be wondering, Daddy, Mommy, how come? What happened? How can they build? There was no technology at that time that will be able to build such a pile of stones inside the river. Then they'll be able to tell the children the story. That we didn't, it wasn't in the river actually. It dried up. And then we picked up all those stones and we built each there as a monument. Then they'll begin to tell those young people, the children, the younger generation, what great things the Lord wrought, manifested, operated in his power in their midst at that time. Then the younger generation will know the kind of God our forefathers served. The kind of God our forefathers served. Memorials, monuments that they were to raise up. Wouldn't it have been wonderful if all the retreats we ever held all the things that ever happened as we came and we walked through our own river jordan the overflowing temptation the overflowing trial the rivers that would have drowned us the difficulties the challenges we urge and the river was dried up for us and we started a small number and now we crossed our river Jordan. Here we are on this side today. Wouldn't it have been wonderful if some people had written down all the testimonies of the great things the Lord had done. And then every time we'll have a monument. We'll have a memorial. And we'll have all the things the Lord had done. And then, you, you know, at your spare time, it's in our hand. All the testimonies of all the past crusades in a book. All the testimonies of the past retreats in a book. All the challenges, all the decisions, and all the, th all the things we scaled through in a book. All the conferences and the congresses we had, and all the details of everything the Lord did. The miraculous deliverances, the miraculous opening of the Jordan before us. And how we overcame our enemies, how our own Jericho walls fell. Wouldn't it have been a great thing if some people are taking that as a project? While the ministers and the priests are standing in the river. And then the river is now dry. And then we can move on. And then we set this memorial there. And our children, while they are learning. Our children, while they are being educated. The books are there. What happened 30 years ago? What happened 25 years ago? What happened 20 years ago? What happened when we didn't have this place? This place was a jungle. And then we had a little building there. What happened at the time we wanted to have the church growth conference? 
I was well, going to invite people from more than 50 countries, Africa and beyond, and we didn't have money. What happened? How did that building the hostel, how did it get there? Will somebody please write it down so that the coming generation, they will be able to see the monument and the memorial of the great activities of the almighty God. Look around here. We used to have just a little building there and it was very hot and then the fan will be blowing hot air on us and then we'll have about 350 in that hall whenever we came for a special meeting and then all do you remember it was just over there and now what brought us here how did this hall come up like this and then these people are all seated here. All the lights and this PA system and everything. Everything going on here. How did we get to this place? Will somebody please put it on record? And write down. And let's have a memorial. A monument of the great activities of the almighty God. That's what God told them to do. Because he knew the children of Israel. And the people of today. We have the tendency of forgetting. And it's when you write it down. As when you build it up, when you set the monument and the memorial, then the coming generation will know where we're coming from and what the Lord had wrought in our midst. And that's what we're looking at now, preserving testimonies for future generations. Preserving testimonies for future generations. In Joshua chapter 4, reading from verse 1. And it came to pass when all the people were clean passed over Jordan that the Lord spake unto Joshua saying take you twelve men out of the people out of every tribe take you men out of all the tribes of Israel and command ye them do you know how many times this word command comes up in Joshua? And we say we believe the whole Bible. And when our overseers come and they say, you go there and do that, you go there and do that, you go and do that, then some people will sit back and say, what I don't like is the method of sending people to do things. This kind of commanding language in this modern time. What I don't appreciate in all these overseers. Don't they understand communication? Are you going to force me to do what I don't want to do? And what I don't like is, you know, this, the way they tell us to do these things. Do this. Do this. We'll show them. And then we fold our hands there. When you go back to school and learn communication, and you know how to talk to we younger generation, then you will understand. I will obey you. But now commanding us, stand up, get down, sit down, do this, do that. No, not in this generation. This is deeper life of the of 2007. We're not we're no more in 1977. But God says he has not changed. And the Bible has not changed. And the will of God is still the same. Here God told Joshua again. How many times will he tell Joshua? Command them. Instruct them. And you know there were some people that were more intelligent than Joshua. Why not? Do you know there were some people that were sent shoulder to shoulder with Joshua? Of course, in the congregation. There might be people that had more children than Joshua had. People that have gotten married before Joshua was married. Why not? But he was their leader. He was the captain. And the Lord told him exactly what to do and how to do it. And he tells us in verse 3, And command ye them, saying, Take you hence 
out of the midst of Jordan. Out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones, and you shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where ye shall lodge this night. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel, one out of every tribe a man and joshua said unto them pass over before the ark of the lord your god into the midst of jordan look at that verse five verse five look at it and joshua said unto them would you mind to pass over Would you mind to stand up so we can pray? Would you mind to please join this team? Would you mind to please go and carry our food so we can eat? Would you mind to get up and help us? If you don't mind, can you help us distribute the food? communication in leadership that they will know what the leader is about and who the leader is the leader does not talk like the subordinate it's all right among you would you mind to please go with me to the bookshop there so i can get a book that's the way you t you should talk like that to yourself that's all right would you mind to give me a cup of water there so I can drink? That's all right for you brothers and sisters to talk together like that. When it comes to leadership, here Joshua told them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan and take you every man of you a stone upon, the, upon his shoulder according unto the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you. And that when your children ask their fathers, in time to come, saying, Watch me ye by these tolls, then ye shall answer them, that the waters of Jordan were cut off, before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over Jordan. The waters of Jordan were cut off. And these stones shall be for a memorial. A monument. A symbol for you to see every time. Unto the children of Israel forever. And the children of Israel did so as Joshua commanded and they took and took up twelve stones out of the midst of Jordan. As the Lord spake unto Joshua according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel and carried them over with them unto the place where they lodged and laid them down there. And Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests, which bear the ark of the covenant stood. And they are there unto this day. We're going to divide the message to three parts. Already the topic I've announced to you, preserving testimonies for future generations. Preserving testimonies for future generations. Number one, indestructible monuments for the Christian's edification. Indestructible monuments for the Christian's edification. Number two, indefatigable ministers, our constant exhortation. Indefatigable ministers, our constant exhortation. Number three, instructive memorials 
for our children's education. Instructive memorials for our children's education. Number one, indestructible monuments for the Christian's edification. That's what we just read out of the scriptures. The stones were to be a sign or a memorial to prevent this great miracle from being forgotten. Israel had a tendency of forgetting, of forgetting God's goodness. If you look at Psalm 78, you will see their tendency, the tendency of forgetting the great things that the Lord had done. That's why you'll find in the writing of the Holy Scriptures, the repetition, I am the Lord your God that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And he brought you into the land of Canaan. You'll find that over and over again. The repetition. Reminding them what God has done in bringing them out of the land of Egypt. And then you'll find in the Psalms. Psalm 78 in particular now. And we're looking at verse 11. Psalm 78 verse 11. And forgot his works. And his wonders that he had showed them. That was their weakness. That was their problem. They were always forgetting great things. Great events. Great miracles. Great manifestation of power. They were always forgetting. And because of that the Lord said to help you remember. That's why you are setting up the monuments and the memorials in verse 41 and verse 42. Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel and they remembered not his hand. They have forgotten. They remembered not his hand, not the day when he delivered them from the enemy. And because of that forgetfulness, that's why the Lord then said, you will raise up monuments, memorials, for you to be able to remember. And God wanted them to remember his power, his love, his mercy, what he had done for them. And we owe each to ourselves to remember all of God's benefits for the recollection of them to be green pastures and still waters. When we're weak. Because that kind of monument, number one, is an inspiration. When we're depressed, when we're discouraged. And every time we see that monument, every time we see that memorial, we're inspired. Number two, it gives joy. A joyous sense of being loved. A joyous sense of being chosen. A joyous sense of being special. And then, number three, it purifies the soul with gratitude. It purifies the soul. There will be no murmuring. There will be no grumbling. It's just like if you think about it. I didn't have breakfast this morning. But thank God, see the great thing the Lord has done for me, which is greater than having a breakfast. It's just like if you think, you know, I wanted to bring, you know, five or six shirts over here. I couldn't get a fact. I got only four shirts to be able to bring here so I can change my dresses. But how are you thinking about just shirts? See the great thing the Lord has done for me. I had, you know, you had, you know, this terrible thing that you have claimed your life and now you're healed and everything is gone. You say, what's a shirt? What's a pair of trusses? A pair of shoes in comparison with this great thing the Lord has done for me. The monument. When we remember that, it will help us and it will purify our hearts from all the complaining, all the, all the murmuring. Not only that, it brightens the future. By the radiance which at once will help us to know that God can be trusted. The future becomes bright. We say the God of yesterday is a God of today and is a God of the future. Because of what he did in the past, we can rely on him. 
And we can depend upon him for the future. The memorials were not made of clay. Because if they are made of clay, if the rain descended, it will dissolve. Everything will be wiped away. And they will be dissolved to the very ground. They were made of stones, heavy stones, big stones that the men carried on their shoulders. So that they will be able to have this as permanent. And it will remain as a testimony for future generations. And all through these generations, those piles of stones... One inside River Jordan. The other one outside River Jordan became an enduring memorial for them. And that's what the Lord is pointing to here. That when the Lord has done something, make a record of it. When the Lord has done something, preserve something about that great deed of the Lord that will bring it back to your memory. Memorials. Monuments. As we look at the scriptures, we even find other parts. Look at Joshua chapter 24. Joshua chapter 24. I'm reading from verse 24. Joshua 24 verse 24. And the people said unto Joshua, The Lord our God we will serve, and his voice we will obey. At that time, the miracles were fresh in their mind. The memorials were fresh in their mind. The monuments that were raised up were present for them to see. And because of what they knew and what they had not forgotten, they said, the Lord our God will, will serve and his voice will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and set them his statutes and an ordinance in, she in Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God and took a great stone and set it up there under an oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said unto all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness unto us, for it has heard all the words of the Lord, which is spake unto us. It shall therefore be a witness unto you, lest ye deny your God. He set up the memorial, another memorial again. Do you know the covenant you have made? Here is a memorial. Do you know the promise you have made? Here is a monument. Do you know what you told the Lord now? I will serve the Lord. Here is the monument for you to remember. It's, it's like when you make a promise to the Lord. If you are to think and go back on all the commitments you have made to the Lord... All the vows were made to the Lord. Do you remember? In that retreat. Do you remember? In that congress. Of tears streaming down your face. Oh Lord. The rest of my life. I give unto you. I will serve you. I will go anywhere. I will do anything and everything you command me. Come rain or sunshine. Friends or foes, difficulties and challenges, no matter where, no matter when, no matter what, I'm going to serve you to the very edge. And then you remember the person that brought you into this church, into this ministry. And then with tears of sorrow, that fellow is gone, but Lord, you have planted my feet on the rock of ages. I want them to come back, but Lord, whether they come back or not, here I am. I will die there. And then you went ahead. Oh Lord, if there will ever be any temptation, any trial that will take me out of this place, Lord, kill me and let me go to heaven before that overwhelming temptation will ever come upon my life. That's what you said, but you didn't write it down. You didn't set up a memorial. You didn't try teach in a book. 
Everything you said before you got married, the covenant, the commitment, the consecration. You didn't tell your wife. And you wrote everything down. And you said, Lord, if it remains the last penny in my pocket, you will be number one. Me, I'm dead. The I, the ego, it's gone. I don't want to think anything about myself. For the rest of my life, here I stand, Lord, like rules. Do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part me and this ministry. That's what you said. But you didn't write it down. You didn't set up a memorial. You didn't set up something to remind you. And then after you got married, you didn't bring out the book and say, my wife, before the honeymoon is over. I don't, and this is what I've said. I said, the Lord should kill me if I will ever backslide. And I said, the Lord should do this with me if I ever will break this vow. My wife, we just got married this week. Read this. And then your wife, she will say, thank God I married you. My, my own consecration is similar. I said I will serve the Lord. And then your wife will take it out of the bag and say, my husband, reach this. In fact, I wanted to tell you, you saw me in deeper life. I hope you'll never come and tell, I made a vow to the Lord. Thank God you are telling me your vow. This is the vow I made to the Lord. That Lord, I'm going to marry this man because I see it's your will. But if this man tomorrow wakes up and he says, I have a call. I'm going somewhere. He will go alone. I will stay in this. I will die in this place. Nothing. If I'm sick and there's retreat, carry me there. If I'm dying and there is a conference, carry me there. Because life or death, alive or dead, I've already given my soul, my spirit, my body unto the Lord. That's who I am. And therefore, man, husband, I love you very much. But if you wake up tomorrow and you say something is going to take you out of this place, count me out. You will go alone. If I will not marry till I die, that's all right. This is my vow. Read it. But you never wrote it down. It was only in your heart. You know what the Lord was telling them? Write it down. Set up a stone. Let your children see. Daddy. Why are you always going to retreat? We didn't even, we don't know our hometown. And the only holiday time when we ought to go and know our village, our hometown, where we came from, there is retreat every time. Every Christmas time when other people are visiting home. Daddy, that's when we have to go for retreat. Can't we miss one? Bring out the book you wrote. And say, children, before I married mommy. Children, before mommy became pregnant. Children, before you were born. Come on now, you can read. You open it up. That Lord, I'll never miss any Bible study. This is my life. I'll never miss any retreat. Now you children, you're talking about going home at the time of Christmas. Reach this. This is the monument. This is the memorial. This is my life. Then your children will know what kind of daddy they have and what kind of mommy they have because they can see the memorial, the monument. But because we don't write it down, then the winds will blow us here and there. We'll begin to write. I said we'll begin to write. I know you can even recollect, you can recollect. At least the much you can recollect, you can begin to put them down now. And you can begin to say, that's my consecration. That's my commitment. That's the absolute surrender. That's what I'm going to do. Do you remember? And there was one day when the pastor called you. Maybe me, your pastor. Maybe, you know, our other great pastor, Sarah, your pastor, when he called you. 
And then you're accused of something you didn't do. And you said, sir, it's not true. I didn't do that. I can never do that. I'm a child of God. Sir, whatever they told you about me, it's not true. I'm a real child of God. And the pastor said, no. I'm disappointed. You have changed. Sir, I've not changed. I'm still myself. No, I don't believe you. And then he placed you on discipline. And then you went back home. You knelt down. You cried. You said, Lord, this is my pastor. Let him knock me. Somebody told him a story about me which is not true. And then he believed that person. And now he's knocking me. But Lord, let him knock me more than that. Under the ministry of this man of God, I will die. And you cried and cried and, and consecrated. And then maybe after a few months, the pastor now discovered the truth. And he called you. And he said, my son, would you forgive me? I made a mistake in disciplining you. Then you cried again. You see, will you still serve the Lord? If I tell you to go back to the work you were doing before, will you still do it? Then you bring out your book. You say, Pastor, look at this. This is where I will die. That's the work I will do. Knock me more than that. I have a consecration. I have a commitment. Write it down. And so, when, if you have gone through a greater storm, and you have overcome, and you have written it down, and no matter, they trample on you, they crush you, they knock you, you go to write it down, Lord, they are knocking me. It's not easy, but thank you for your grace, and you write it down. Then when all the soft winds are blowing, something not too serious, you'll not mind, you'll go back to your book that you wrote down. It's a memorial. It's a monument. And then you'll say, Lord, I'm still standing. I see the memorial, the monument every time. That's why they were to write it down. Indestructible monuments. In fact, it's next to your Bible. The Bible, that's number one in your life. And then the memorial, the book. The notebook. It's not the notebook where you're writing all your notes now. This is a special notebook. It's something, if, 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 uh, there is a, if there's any problem in the house, and the house is about to burn, the very first thing you go and take, you grab your Bible, you grab that book, you run out. If the fire will burn, all the clothes, I'll buy another cloth. If the fire will burn, any other property, I'll buy other properties, but this monument indestructible. That's what the Lord was telling them. Indestructible monuments for the Christian's edification. And they were to raise that up. You raise up your own monument. I come to point number two. Indefatigable ministers, our constant exhortation. Indefatigable ministers, our constant exhortation. I'm reading from Joshua chapter 4. In Joshua chapter 4, we're reading from verse 10. For the priest which bear the axe stood in the midst of Jordan until everything was finished. Stop there for a moment. Don't read too fast. The priest stood there. You know what they were doing? They were carrying the ark. And they were bearing up the ark. That's tiring. Well, be tired. Are we not human beings? And then all these children of Israel are passing over. Are passing over. And those priests looked. There were still many people. Looks like we have to stand here for a long time. And then they kept on standing. They kept on standing there. Until everybody will pass over. Indefatigable ministers. Our constant exhortation. 
You know, sometimes there are times we get tired. There are times we get tired. And yet, we still have to do our work. In, um, in September, I was in New York. We were having workers retreat. And in the hotel room where I was, and it was very cold, very, very cold. And you, you have to really dress up for the cold. But the cleaner who had cleaned the room had opened the window in the afternoon. And because there was a curtain, we couldn't see that the, that the uh, window was opened. And all through the night, I breathed in all the, the cold air. And by the time in the morning, I could barely talk. It was almost like a whisper. And yet, I went, I did all that I needed to do there in New York. And then I had to go to Dallas. To also go and have the, the, the workers uh, conference there. And already my voice was gone in New York. And I was coughing. That's why I want to look at some of you young people when I come in and you are coughing to make fun of your pastor. I feel these people don't know. I'm dying on the job and the children, the young people are so happy and you know that because I cough when I preach, they don't understand the background. And that's funny to them. And then eventually when I finished over there, we were to have a, a, a meeting in Leeds. That's in UK. I came from Dallas and went to, and I went to Leeds. By the time I got there, now my throat was completely choked. I could barely talk. And then that night, as uh, the congressional song was going on, I spoke to the National Versailles in UK. I was sitting by my side. I said, brother... Hear, see the way I'm talking. The people will not hear me. And I'll be coughing at the end of every sentence. Would you please take the meeting tonight? He said, sir, we're praying for you. He didn't accept. You know, sometimes uh, uh, people, uh, they, they say no. The people are waiting for you. And uh, so I got up. And I took the mic. And then I said, let us pray. They could barely hear. But I was a child there in Leeds. Nine years of age. That day of the meeting starting was his birthday. But his body, if you looked at his body, it was like the body of a frog. He was scratched. And he was scratched. Blood will be coming out. And he'll keep on scratching. It was a kind of disease. And it was terrible. And the mother, the mother had a great, great sickness that they'll put, the husband will put towel inside cold water and be rubbing the body all through the night. They will not sleep. The child was like that. The body all black. And the body all swollen up here and there. Like the body of a frog. And that child said, as the Jesus is coming to Leeds, this would be my day of healing and deliverance. And that boy, 90 years of age, did not eat that day. And I was there. And my voice was gone. And I was coughing almost at the end of every sentence. But the boy didn't look at my voice. The boy didn't mind my coughing. The boy just said, this is my day. And then at the end, I made an altar call. And sinners came and they received the Lord. It was like a miracle service. And then after that, I said, now we're going to pray. And as we pray, the Lord is going to deliver you. Not like I'm talking now. It, you know, it, it was bad. It was, I was say, uh, you know. And yet, you know, I'm, I have a commitment. I have a commitment. All the scriptures I ought to read, I read all the scriptures. And sometimes it will appear as if I should have a, a kind of water to drink, warm water to drink while I'm preaching. But I said, no, that's not my practice. I'm not going to do that here. And then I could barely get my breath. Then I will stop and breathe deep and methodically and then go on talking. But all those people did not see that. All they wanted was that this is our day. And then I prayed. 
And I said, whatever problem you have, lay your hand upon yourself. And then you're going to receive something now. And then that boy raised up the hand. And then was said, if you have this money, come out. Some people came out, but he was just in the crowd. He went back home. They woke up in the morning. When he got up in the morning, that boy, and said, mommy, mommy, come. Come quick. The mother didn't know. The mother thought something had happened. That was, you know, kind of a dangerous thing. And so the mother came in and looked at the body of the child. It was like the body of a baby, totally clean. All those things had gone away. And then now the mother, the mother said, what? If this will happen to my child, how about me? Then they came to see me that evening, the husband and the wife. And the problem was so terrible that the wife said, Pastor, my husband will explain to you what the problem is. I cannot talk. And then the husband told me, sir, let me explain to you the problem of my wife. The reason she cannot explain is if she is saying it and talking, she'll start crying because it was too deep. It was too emotional. It was too great. And then the husband explained the problem. And remember what I'm telling you is that I could barely talk. And then as they sat down before me, I said, that's all right, let's pray. And then when I said, let's pray, then I coughed a little. And then I prayed for them. In the middle of the prayer, when I want to say, in Jesus' name, before I pronounce the Jesus, before I finish, then the dry throat will come again, and then I woke up. They didn't each mind. All they wanted, they knew the power is in the man. Whether he's coughing or not, what does that matter to them? All they wanted was a miracle. And then I said, praise the Lord, you've got it. I don't know how many times I called before I finished the short prayer. And then they went back home. And that sister, she's, uh, you know, she's a member of the choir there. And then she came, this leads, she came the following night. And then when she began to talk, she said, before I give my testimony, then she sang that song, number 24, of our own GHS. It is well. It is well. When billows, troubles, trials, like see billows roll, and that sister could sing. And then she began to say what had happened to her for years. And the miracle that happened to our own son, nine years of age. And the miracle, the birthday matched that miracle. And then she said, if my boy can get that, then let me go and see the pastor with my husband. And I got, she got her own miracle. And then I looked at myself. I said, what if I just cancel the program because of my tiredness or because of the cold or because of all the things going on? And sometimes when I come back to Lagos, after such a tiring kind of, um, of, of trip, and then I come to have, you know, what I should do is just to say, no, no combined service. But, you know, I come on Saturday and my voice is almost gone. And then I still say, now, we're going to have Sunday combined service. I'm, I'm just giving you a, an example so that you will see this is how the general superintendent is doing it. It's just come back yesterday and it's gone to all these other places. And yet you see and now he will not even stop. And yet, you know, his voice is tired and it's, you know, he can barely get through. And yet, he will not cut his message to 20 minutes or 30 minutes to give you a sermonet because a sermonet will make a Christian net. But when you have the full sermon, that will make a full Christian. Praise the Lord. And so you see, they were in the fatigue table. And this is what I learned. This is the food I eat. What gives me the strength. These are the mentors I have. These are the examples before me that I say, they are in the fatigue table. 
They are not stopping. Even though the challenges are there, they're still moving on. And I follow these mentors. And if I follow them, I'm doing well. You ought to follow me. You are following already. I said you are following already. I'm reading to you from verse 10. For the priest which bear the axe church in the midst of Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord commanded Joshua to speak unto the people according to all that Moses commanded Joshua. And the people hasted and passed over. Why would they make haste to pass over? And the people hasted and they passed over because they were considerate. They knew these priests are standing there and bearing the ark. And they will not leave that post of duty until we have all gone over in compassion, in sympathy for them. Why don't we hurry up? They hasted. That's being considerate. That's being considerate. Have you noticed something? If we preach something and then you don't make haste and do it, we have to preach it again. If you don't make haste and do it, we have to preach it again. If you don't make haste and do it, you have to, we have to make haste, we have to do it again. Because we have to say it until the people are saved. We have to keep on saying it on the, until the people are sanctified. We have to keep on saying it until the people are ready for heaven. And if you are considerate and compassionate about us standing here, you will make haste. You will hurry up. You will say, we are delaying the ministers and the priests and they are standing there. And if we don't hurry up and do it, they will keep on standing there. And if we want to make progress, then let's make haste. Another reason why they made haste. They have been in the wilderness for 40 years. And now the promised land was ahead of them. And they were in a hurry to get to the promised land. They said, wonderful. Here is River Jordan. The only thing was Jericho hindering us from the promised land. We want to move in quick. That's why they made haste. And when you see the glory ahead of you. When you see the joy ahead of you. When you see the success, the accomplishment, the promise ahead of you. And you want to get there quick. You'll make haste. Just like these people did in verse 11. And it came to pass. When all the people were clean passed over. That the ark of the Lord passed over. And the priests in the presence of the people. And the children of Reuben. And the children of God and of the tribe of Manasseh passed over and before the children of Israel. As Moses spake unto them, about 40,000 prepared for war passed over before the Lord unto, unto the battle and to the plains of Jericho. On that day the Lord magnified Joshua in the sight of all Israel and they feared him. As they feared Moses all the days of his life. You'll see then what they did. These ministers so indefatigable and they'll not get tired. They just kept on doing the work. Verse 15 now. And the Lord spake unto Joshua saying, command the priest. You cannot miss the word. Command the priest. This is God. This is God. Now, if you read the books of psychology. The books of psychology, they don't talk like this. If you read all those uh, books on administration, they don't talk like this. And, you know, they give a different kind of understanding about uh, leadership and, you know, the subordinate. And uh, you know, about the manager, managerial kind of studies. If you do all those, they, start, they don't choose the word command. No. It's only the military they use that word very often. But when you're thinking of management, administration, you don't think about the, the psychology of people management. They don't talk about command. But you see, the language of the scripture is different. And the language of Christ and language of God is different. And it says in that verse 16, command the priests. 
that they that bear the ark of the testimonies that they come up out of Jordan. They waited there until the word came to them to come out. They remained there. They had finished the work. Why don't you come out? We're waiting for instruction. We're waiting for command. We're waiting for a release to come out. Because all the people are passed over. All the stones have been taken. Why are you still waiting? Because we came here by command. And we'll leave by command. In verse 17, Joshua therefore commanded the priests. Saying, come ye up out of Jordan. And it came to pass when the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord were come up out of the midst of Jordan that the soles of the priest of the priest's feet were lifted up unto the dry land that the waters of Jordan returned unto their place and flowed over all its banks as they did before that tells us then how we are to work for the Lord not getting tired Yes, tired in one sense, but still going on and moving on. In First Samuel chapter 23, Second Samuel rather, Second Samuel chapter 23, verse 10. Second Samuel chapter 23, verse 10. And he arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clave unto the sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day. And the people returned after him only to spoil. It says his hand was weary. Even though he was weary. Even though he was tired in the physical. Yet he said we must finish it up. We must get to the end of the battle. We must move on until the work is done. Until the accomplishment is real, visible. Even though he was weary. Even though he was tired. Yet his sand still cleave to the sword. And that's what the Lord is expecting that we will do. We're going to do it. Then we're told in Romans chapter 12 verse 11. Romans chapter 12. Reading from verse 11. Not slothful in business. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. Not slothful in business. But fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. Still fervent in spirit. And you know sometimes um, uh, while I'm. You, over here, I have quite a heavy schedule of duty and of work. And then eventually, we, we go to, I finish here. When I finish here, then I run to the other side. Like this, uh, this past December, we finished the retreat on the 26th of December. And by that time, you understand, I was preaching three times every day. The faith clean, the Bible teaching, then the revival something in the, in the evening, three times. And it's time of Amatan, cold. And then when we finished on 26 in the morning, then 26, the evening, I went to UK for their own December retreat. They said, please, you must come. Because they will not have something like this for a long time. You must come. And I said, I will come. And then I got there on the 27. And then when we landed in London, we had to drive a long distance to go to the campsite. Long, long distance away, hours. And then we got there. And then we started uh, the, the program started on seven. And then I began the marathon kind of preaching again. Yes, they used, uh, you know, the, what they downloaded from the internet, uh, from what we have done. Then I added my own beat. And then on the 29th, I, you know, jumped in the plane again. 30 years, I came over here. And then 31st. And on the 4th, we got started. 
over here. And when I come here on the force, and I'm going, to, you know, that Bible study, salt and light in the new year. It was when I was over there. I was, you know, I was doing the retreat over there, 27 to 30 years. I'm preparing the Monday Bible study of the force. At the same time, I finished over there. I emailed it to Lagos for the press to preach. And while we're here having this crusade, having this uh, congress, I've already prepared the outline for next Monday. You see, that is, that is life. That's how I do it. And yet when I come, I cannot say, you know, I'm tired. The work is so much. If I want to laugh, I still laugh. And if I want to make you laugh, when I need a laughter from you, I know how to get it. I said I know how to get it. I'm still going to get a lot of laughter from you before you go. Praise the Lord. But you know, just to remain excited. And not just to remain strong. And just to remain on the job without saying there is too much I am doing. That you are not slothful in business. And at all your time, all your life is taken up by the work and you enjoy it. I'm transferring something to you. You have got it already. In Ecclesiastes chapter, chapter 9 verse 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 we're looking at verse 10 this is what it says whatsoever thy hand findest to do do it with thy might for there is no work no device no knowledge no wisdom in the grave with that thou goest it says, whatever you find to do, give it all you've got, all your stress, all your energy, all your skill, all your ability, everything you've got. Give it everything because there is no knowledge or wisdom or device in the place where you're going beyond this time. We will do it. We now come to point number three. Instructive memorials for children's education. Instructive memorials for our children's education. We're looking at Joshua chapter 4. In Joshua chapter 4, we're reading it from verse 19. Joshua chapter 4. Reading from verse 19. And the people came up out of Jordan. On the tenth day of the, of the first month. And encamped in Gilgal. In the east border of Jericho. And those twelve stones. Which they took out of Jordan. The Joshua pitch in Gilgal. And, and he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean these toes, these memorials, these monuments that we raise up here? What's the meaning? What's the significance? What can we learn from this? Then ye shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. The Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you until ye were passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up from before us until we were gone over. That all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that ye might fear the Lord your God forever. Memorials. Now, uh, Joshua had mentioned the Red Sea, that the Lord divided the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. 
to go through the wilderness and then get to the land of Canaan. And now the Lord has divided for us River Jordan and we're setting memorials here. And when your children will ask you, what mean these toes? How significant is this? Why do we have this pile of stones here? One pile inside River Jordan. One pile outside River Jordan. What's the meaning? Then you will tell your children what the Lord has done. Wait, Joshua. You just told us now that you came out of the Red Sea. A similar miracle. Why wasn't any monument or memorial raised up in the Red Sea? Great question. Why wasn't any monument or memorial raised up outside the Red Sea? Good question. Because the children of the Jews, of the Israelites, will not be on that side of Egypt. Never go back to Egypt. They'll never go there. If you raise up a memorial there, they are ne they'll never see it. They were not to live in the wilderness. If you raise up a memorial there, they'll never see, they'll never ask any question. But it's on, we're now in the promised land. On this side, Jordan. And now we are in the territory that is given to the people of Israel. And their children will see the memorial because it's in Jordan. Which is a demarcation between the land of promise and the wilderness. And then now on this side of Jordan. Where was Jesus baptized? River Jordan. That's part of their territory. And therefore, their children will see. You should know where to set up a memorial. And where not to set up a memorial. Where your children will see. They'll be able to ask the question, Daddy, why is this? Mommy, why is this? Then you'll be able to tell them how great our God is. How great and how wonderful what the Lord has done for us. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 38. Isaiah chapter 38. Our God is great. And our God is wonderful. Chapter 38, verse 19. The living, the living, he shall praise thee. As I do this day, the father to the children shall make known thy truth. Your children will ask questions. And you parents, you will make known, you'll make known unto the children the truth. The great mighty deeds and acts of the Lord. You'll tell them. And that's why they raised the memorial. We have the responsibility of teaching our children. Telling them what the Lord has done. Telling them the great accomplishments and the miracle working power of the almighty God. We must tell them. Because it's in the telling them we'll be able to make them remain in the faith. In the same faith was delivered unto the saints. That's what the mother and the grandmother of Timothy did for him. Second Timothy chapter 1. Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 5. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned face that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and in thy mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded that in thee also, pass it on, the message of life, pass it on. The message of eternal life, pass it on. The great mighty power of our God who heals and saves and delivers, pass it on. And the power of the Lord to sanctify and make holy, pass it on. And then the great revelation of knowing the will of God. Did you ever talk to your child how you got married? Children? You never even ask how daddy and mommy came together. Children, you never even asked me how daddy and mommy came to know that we, that is the will of God for us to get married. Just as if you are playing with them, telling them testimony. 
And then, you know, the children, hey, Daddy, before you talk, let me go and call the other children. And then they all come. Daddy wants to tell us a story. And then you begin to tell them how you prayed, how you knew the will of God. And wouldn't want you want to marry somebody like that looks like mommy? Because mommy and daddy they never quarrel, they never fight. And you know how they love one another. And how they do everything together. Wouldn't would you want to get a wife like that? That looks just like mommy. Telling them, telling them the great things the Lord has done. And it is when you tell them. It will be indelible in their hearts. It's for the children's education. The children's education. And when you tell them things like that, in a very practical way, when they come to church and we're talking about the will of God, it's just it's like adding just something slight to what they already know. You tell them at home. You instruct them at home. And then they'll be able to stand. They will stand in Jesus' name. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 15. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 15. And that from a child. Thou hast known the holy scriptures. Which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. Through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Jesus, Psalm 78, reading from verse 3. Psalm 78, reading from verse 3. In Psalm 78, verse 3, which we have heard and known, and our fathers told us that's the importance of the memorial. That's why the memorials are raised up. Our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children. Showing to the generation to come. The praises of the Lord. And his strength and his wonderful words. That he has done. That's what the Lord wants us to do. Telling them in verse 5. For he established a testimony in Jacob. And appointed a law in Israel. Which he commanded our fathers. That they should make them known to their children. That's why there is a memorial. That they should make known all the mighty power of God. And all the ex exploits. They should make that known to their children. In verse 6. That the generation to come might know them. Even the children which shall be born. Who should arise and declare them to their children. That they might say they are hoping God. That's the reason. That when you tell them and you show them those monuments and memorials they'll be able to set their hope in God and not forget the works of God does it and not forget without the memorials without the monuments they will forget but you will preserve the testimony the memorial the monument so that they will not forget but keep his commandments. The Lord has revealed quite a lot to us in this study. Preserving testimonies for future generations. And you have testimonies already. Our church has testimonies already. How you were saved. How you were sanctified. How you were made holy. How the Adamic nature was taken away from your heart. How the mighty power of God grabbed you and then the lion within was turned to a lamb and the judas in you was touched and now there is only john that has been lifted up out the lord dried up the water and the river the overwhelming temptation that should have hindered you from getting to the land and now you have a testimony of triumph of victory that god has made you more than a conqueror write it down put it down preserve it so that the coming generation will be able to know and tell how great our god is let's rise up and commit ourselves to the lord 
the great things the Lord has done. Do you remember your salvation? Great, great miracle. Do you remember your sanctification? Great, great miracle. Do you remember the restitution you made? It was terrifying and it was a kind of disturbing. And you said, how will I get through this river Jordan of, a, of restitution? It was like, if I do this, I'm gone. If I do this, I'm drowned. If I do this, what? How will I be able to preserve my job? And you did that restitution and then something glorious, something great came out of it. Write it down. The memorial. The memorial, the monument, the testimony of the great thing the Lord has done for you. And then you are able to share with your children. You are able to share with your children. And you are able to tell them, here is what God did. Here is how God did it. And then it will be for their own education, their own exhortation, their own enlightenment, and their own edification. The consecrations of the past, put them down. The commitments of the past, put them down. All the decisions of the past, all the dedication and all the consecration of the past, put them down as memorial. And then day after day, month after month, you'll be reading them. You'll be reading them. You'll be going over them again. Everything you open your mouth to tell the Lord with tears, with faith, with absolute surrender. And you yielded yourself fully unto the Lord. Write it down. And then show your children. Let your wife know about it. Let your husband know about it. Great things the Lord has wrought. In your heart. In your life. Put everything down. As the Lord has lifted you from being a member to a minister. Did you write that down? The great things the Lord has wrought in your life. Did you put that down? Remind yourself. With that monument. With that memorial. Remind yourself of those great, great things the Lord has done. So you will not forget how the Lord moved you from there to here. So you will not forget. indestructible monuments you keep them in a place they will not be destroyed so you can read over and over the great manifestation of the power of God in your life and in our church indestructible monuments, memorials for the Christian's edification and indefatigable ministers tired but still going on challenged but still moving on weary sometimes but still going on He was weary of the battle, but his hand cleaved to the sword. That's the work you do. And as long as the work is still there, you will not allow tiredness. You will not allow weakness. You're moving on. What these people, Joshua and his team, 
as a constant exhortation for every one of us. And nothing broke the unity. Nothing broke their commitment. They didn't complain about the commanding tone of Joshua. The Lord told him to command them. And he did. And they didn't mind. They didn't begin to split ears about the language of communication. What's important is here is the duty. Carry it out. Get it done. I don't allow ego, pride to hinder us from doing what needs to be done. Those people must have been sanctified. Those leaders must have been sanctified. Those officers and priests must have been sanctified for them to work in unity, in submission to their leader Joshua like they did. And these things were written for our learning upon whom the ends of the world are come. And we are to follow after their footsteps. They were human beings like we are human beings too. Men and women of like passions as we are. And they found enough grace, enough strength of character to do what the Lord wanted them to do through their leader. We can have the same grace too. And the same strength of character too. So this work of the Lord will prosper in our hands. Instructive memorials for our children's education. Instructive memorials for our children's education. Preserve the record for your children. Tell them what the Lord has done. Tell them of the great experience of salvation. How you are saved. Let the children know. How you are sanctified. Let the children know. How the Lord made you overcome. Those great, great temptations. And you went through the deep water. Of Jordan. That were have overwhelmed you. How did you get the victory? Let your children know. Testimonies. It's a great part. Of our children's edification. Exhortation. And education. And let the converts know too. Let our members know too. Let the people of God know too, so they can see the monument, so they can see the memorials. In Jesus' name we pray. Yeah. It looks like it's an amen that is coming out of sleep. Yeah. Praise the, uh, that will wake up those who are sleeping. God bless every one of you.
Father, we thank you at this time and we glorify you. Thank you, Lord, because of this rich study of the word of God. We are praying, O oh Lord, we will not just hear it, we will do it in Jesus' name. And then as we remember the great things that you have wrought in our lives and in the lives of members of our family and then in the lives of people in the church, then it will be an encouragement for every one of us. It will edify every one of us. It will enlighten and educate us. The great things you can still do today. We're praying, oh Lord, we'll recollect all these testimonies. We'll bring back to mind all these testimonies. Testimonies of great spectacular salvation. Testimonies of great spectacular sanctification experience. And the great things, many other things you have done. Oh Lord, we'll always remember them in Jesus' name. And then with the assurance of what you have done in the past, we'll be able to look at the future knowing if you did that in the past, you're still able to do much more, much more in the future. Do that in our lives in Jesus' name. That the faith and the confidence that rises within us in the present time, because of the great things of the past, then we'll be able to have hope for the future. If he did that in the past, he'll do much more in the future. I will pray, Lord, we'll not forget our consecrations of the past, our dedications of the past, and the vows we made to you in the past that will serve you to the very end where we are tired. Oh, Lord, make us strong. Put the fire within us again. Give us zeal once again. Help us, Lord, to remember all the journey we have gone through, all the fellowship we have with you, and all the commitment we have made with you. And then, as a result of that, we'll hold on to the very end in Jesus' name. Lord, we're not weak, we're strong. We're not tired, we're still energetic. We're not going to sit down, we're going to move on. This work of God will prosper in our hands. We pray, Lord, that after this Congress, we'll never be the same again. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name.